A daily drop of corrosion on your soul. That's how a former LAPD detective turned book author Joseph Wamba explained the daily grind of police work. Now we know that policing is inherently a dangerous profession, and we know that you typically tend to make your living in kind of the worst of conditions. So I wanted to spend a second to talk about why people come into the profession of policing to get an understanding. So, James Van Oosting, a researcher, came up with two different approaches to life choices. He said there's the professional and there's the vocational. The root of the word vocation comes from the Latin vocare, which means to be called. Now, for those of you old enough to remember, the U.S. Navy used to advertise that theirs wasn't just a job, it was an adventure. Well, I think we could, be, we could say of law enforcement that it's not just a job, it's a calling. In fact, 85% of officers surveyed in a particular study considered the job to be a higher calling rather than just an occupation. And one definition of vocation that I particularly like refers to it as an approach to a particular life role that's oriented towards deriving or, def or, or demonstrating your life's purpose. So spirituality as a concept has never been definitively defined by researchers. But all of the researchers tend to agree that spirituality, the main component of spirituality, is purpose or meaning in life. So, Kerry Friedman, the author of Spiritual Survival for Law Enforcement, he tells us that the, the primary component, or the, the primary um, reason for spirituality or the, the goal of any kind of system of spirituality is to infuse one's life with transcendent value and meaning. Now, let me differentiate here and, and clarify that when I talk about spirituality, I'm not talking about religion. Religion can be a form that spirituality may take or can take, but spirituality would be the, the source behind that form. And spirituality is a very uh, personal and individual endeavor. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. So, Kerry Friedman notes that the reasons that people come into the profession of law enforcement are both noble and spiritual. In fact, he states that there can be no more noble or spiritual aspiration than to serve and protect. And I kind of agree with him on that. So we can say that spir uh, that law enforcement is a spiritual, spiritual calling. The caution that Van Oosting tells us is that adhering to a life calling actually brings with it, uh, leads to a life of what he calls a life of sacrifice. And all too often I think that the new officers coming into the profession aren't adequately prepared to deal with those sacrifices that they're asked to make, and you all know the sacrifices we're talking about. In fact, Van Oosting goes on to say that continued adherence to one's calling can lead to what he calls a world of darkness. So officers, when they first hit the streets, the reality of the profession clashes with their expectations of what the profession is. And they realize that it's no longer about swooping in and being the hero of the day. Um, rather, it's more about confrontation and crisis that there are going to be people that will hate them for no particular reason. They, very quickly they become, they come to feel unappreciated by the very people that they're serving and protecting and risking their lives for every day. And they're ostracized and even mentally and physically abused. So what happens is they tend to pull away. And they'll pull away from some of those supports that they had come to rely on through their lives. And things such as organized religion 
they start losing faith in because they start, they start distrusting the people in the institutions or they lose faith in those people and institutions that they used to trust. So they end up pulling away and they might even pull away from loved ones. Some will pull away completely into what is referred to as a state of spiritual isolation, where they'll kind of isolate themselves from all of society. And some will just isolate themselves from anybody that's not another cop. And that might sound familiar to some of us in the room. Right? We might call church call, choir practice, debriefing sessions after work, right? So Friedman uses the analogy of a bank account to illustrate spirituality as a, in a police officer. And he says that we come into, every person that comes into law enforcement comes in with a certain level of hope and faith in that every time the police officer encounters evil or suffering, they make a withdrawal from that bank account. And that over time, if the officer doesn't intentionally make deposits back into that account, it becomes depleted and overdrawn into what Friedman refers to as a state of spiritual bankruptcy. And this is where those reservoirs of um, idealism and passion and energy are drying up or have dried up. So when this happens and, and the officers enter this state of spiritual bankruptcy, it brings with it a level of pain. And as human beings, what do we tend to do when we experience pain? We'll take something to alleviate that pain, right? So perhaps that might be part of the reason for those church calls and choir practices after work, right? We might anesthetize, try to temporarily anesthetize that pain with some kind of a substance, whether it's alcohol or maybe even something more harsh. But we know that over time, if the pain isn't dealt with effectively, it grows into despair. And eventually, despair becomes hopelessness. Viktor Frankl, a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps in World War II, observed that the one factor that seemed to differentiate between those that survived the camps and those that died was hope. He noted that those with just the smallest sliver of hope seemed to have enough to survive, while those that didn't have any hope died. So if we look at the numbers in law enforcement, in 2009, 400 police officers took their own lives. That's more than the combined total of officers killed in the line of duty in 2012, 2013, and 2014 combined. Some research tells us that police officers are eight times more likely to take their own life than to, be, than to, than to die at the hands of someone else. So if that statistic isn't startling enough, consider this. In one study, 98, let me repeat that, 98% of the officers that were surveyed in this study admitted of contemplating taking their own life at some point during the career. That hits me in the heart. But what that also does is it paints a picture for us. It paints a picture of depleted spirituality, or what we might more commonly refer to as burnout. So, burnout isn't what we might tend to think of when we use the term, right? When we tell our coworkers or our loved ones that you know, I feel so burnt out at work, okay? We all get run down and tired, and we can kind of, once we get a chance to take a break and we can step back and rejuvenate, right? Burnout goes beyond that. Burnout is a prolonged, a prolonged um, thing um, that results from chronic stress. Now, Policing is, a, is an inherently stressful profession. In 2015, it was ranked the fifth most stressful profession in the United States. And that was up from ninth just the year prior. So they reached that, that uh, rating based on several factors. Factors like um, uh, physical exertion at work, interaction with the public, 
um, encountering hazards, threat to your own life or threat to somebody else's. I mean, heck, they might as well have just defined policing with that, right? Because it fits all those categories. Well, those are all factors that we would label as uh, operational stress factors. But there's a, a whole other realm of stress factors out there, and they're called organizational stress factors. Research dating back to 1974 and several times since then has found that the organizational factors contribute more to the stress of the police officer than the operational factors do. Things like the authoritative or authoritarian um, management model, the internal disciplinary practices, those things that tend to influence the perception of organization, of the, the officer's perception of organizational justice in the agency. So these, those things have been found to actually create more stress for the officer. Now, historically, police agencies have been uh, structured in a, in a mechanistic mili uh, type of st uh, structure where power is kind of concentrated at the top of the organization, mandates come down, and officers are, are expected to implement those mandates. And leaders tend to focus on controlling the, the behaviors of their subordinates through policies and procedures, rules and regulations, and threat of discipline. And I'm sure that probably sounds familiar to some people in this room. The problem with that is that that very structure has been found to create in the leaders a, a perception of people as resources to be used. And anybody that's familiar with the work of Immanuel Kant and his categorical imperative knows that that's actually a form of unethical behavior. And that the specific leadership style related to that is actually dehumanizing. So what we're doing is we're actually exacerbating the problem, oftentimes, that we're taking those factors that are actually within our control in policing, and we're not adhering to best practices, and we're actually adding to the stress levels of the police officer. So as I said, burnout is not just that tired feeling. It goes beyond that. But spirituality can be a way to protect the officers from burnout, because Stress has actually been found to be related to spirituality. So over time, stress has been found to actually change the, change the brain physiologically. It becomes a part of the functioning of the brain. And while that involves the communication between neurons and synapses and all those things that I don't understand, and maybe you will, but what I can understand is that the research says, the medical research says that it actually negatively affects officers' abilities to make complex decisions, and it's those complex decisions that they're going to be expected to make every day. But with, with spiritual health and maintaining the spiritual welfare of the, of the police officer, it, it can actually work to change the negative effects of this chronic toxic exposure in policing and actually enhance officers' resilience to stress. Now, why we don't focus more on spirituality and policing is actually amazing to me because in 1991, there was actually testimony in front of the U.S. House of Representatives where the spiritual health of the police officer was considered a top priority. However, fast forward 18 years later, in 2009, it looked like it was finally starting to gain some traction. In fact, the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin dedicated an entire issue to the topic of police spirituality. But the very next year, one researcher would observe that even after all that time, spirituality is often the most neglected and contentious aspect of law enforcement. So it's incumbent upon leaders to find ways to, um, to work to protect the spirituality of the police officer. If nothing else, you're going to protect that police officer from the three components of burnout. So emotional exhaustion being the first component, depersonalization or dehumanization being the second component, and diminished personal accomplishment. Now, as a, any kind of a law enforcement leader or a leader of any organization, those three things should be of critical importance, right? Think about the, the outcome of an officer who was emotionally exhausted and has dehumanize the very people that they're attempting to police and protect, serve and protect. 
and you could actually think back to maybe some instances of excessive uses of force and maybe offer that as an explanation about what prompted the officer to, to use excessive force. So I'll leave you with this. In last year's WinX conference, retired Marine Corps Colonel uh, Richard Coleman kind of gave a mandate to the crowd there. And he asked that we get back to the spirit of our, of our vocational calling and understand our purpose as law enforcement. And I thought that was pretty power, powerful. And I will kind of reiterate Colonel Coleman's call, particularly to the leaders in law enforcement, to start focusing on the spiritual welfare of their officers in the department to enhance not only the health of the, of the officer, but enhance their overall performance for the agency so that they can continue to serve and protect in their highest capacity and maintain a high standard of living beyond going home. You heard one of my colleagues earlier today talk about what happens when you get home. Well, let's take care of these officers so that when they do get home, they have that high level of, of standard of living, that they maintain the quality of their personal relationships, that they don't isolate themselves from the rest of society and their loved ones, and can actually help to continue to contribute to moving their communities forward and the profession of law enforcement forward, much like the, the mentoring that Jonathan talked about early today. So I would ask that that calling be, uh, that be what I leave to you today, and think about how we can address um, the spiritual aspect of policing to enhance their lives and the profession of policing overall. Thank you.